All right, good morning. Um, in today's lecture, we're going to talk about the biochemistry of the senses, of the sensory organs, and more specifically, of the cells that are involved in sensing various modalities um, inside the body and mostly outside of the body. Um, but the, the, the mechanisms are quite, quite similar if we are sensing something that is outside or that is inside our body, as we'll see. Uh, the focus of the lecture is going to be really on the molecular and cellular mechanisms inside cells. So I will not spend a lot of time talking about the physiology of the senses, which I assume you have covered or will cover in physiology. Okay, So I will take that for granted. And I will also not spend a huge amount of time on the structure of those organs and of those tissues, because that's already been covered as well. Okay, So we'll be mostly focusing on what goes on inside those cells and what those processes uh, are. So if we're talking about senses, um, is there any kind of uh, um, any way of dividing them based on the modalities that they perceive, that they uh, detect, very broadly speaking? That's a question. <laughs> Okay, chemical and physical. physical. Yeah, chemical and physical is a good division of senses. And as we'll see today, the majority of senses that we have in our body, and I'm taking the word or the term senses quite broadly. Um, it's not necessarily one of the, the traditional five senses, but we'll be talking about some other, I mean, there are basically tens, if not hundreds of different types of senses that we have in our body. Uh, and as we'll see, large major majority of all those senses is uh, they are chemical senses okay and only very few are physical senses and out of those physical ones as we'll see in a second some of them are kind of disguised chemical senses so they pretend to be physical senses or they are in one way they are physical senses but in other they are really chemical senses just kind of disguised as we'll see in a second all right so we have chemical and physical senses and if we take the the whole big bunch of physical senses, what kind of senses would fit in there? Vision. Okay, vision is one of the disguised, disguised chemical senses that we'll see in a second, but yes, it is, of course, it is perceiving light, so it is a physical, sen a physical sense in this sense. Touch, Touch? yeah, Hearing. Hearing. Taste is not a physical sense, no. Proprioception, Proprioception absolutely. Pain, um, pain um, could be a physical sense, sort of. Could be a chemical sense, because it depends on what stimulus is really causing the pain. Um, so pain is kind of, yeah, in, nondescript in this respect. Temperature, Temperature absolutely. Sound. Sound, so the sense is called... Hearing, yeah, absolutely, yeah, hearing, yeah, is a physical sense. There are at least a couple that we haven't mentioned, but they're not the typical senses, but they are still very important for the functioning of the body. We already mentioned temperature, but yes, temperature is definitely one of them. Pressure, pressure absolutely, and what, what kind of pressure are you thinking of? Because we spoke about touch, which involves pressure to some extent. But what other kinds of pressure can we detect? Vibration. Sorry? Vibration. We can detect vibration, so that's a separate one. We absolutely can. Yes, that's another one, another physical sense. But what kind of pressure? If we're talking about pressure, what, what kind of pressure are we talking about? Discrimination. Okay, let's stay with pressure. Okay, so apart from touch, which is a type of pressure, absolutely. Are there other types of pressure that our, our body can detect and has to detect in order for us to survive? Like pressure inside the lungs. Pressure inside lungs, okay. That's more a stretch, but yeah. Like in the ear, in the head, with the... Uh, How about blood pressure? Isn't that something we're sensing and detecting all the time and regulating? Okay, so we have battery receptors which are detecting the pressure inside blood vessels. Yeah. Okay. Physical or chemical? That's physical. 
Okay, it's physical, and we'll talk a little bit about what kind of sensors we have for uh, for pressure. And there is another very important type of pressure that we are constantly monitoring in our body, in our brain, actually. It's also a type of pressure, but not any of the ones that we just mentioned. Mm, not not really, not not directly, anyway. It's like think about a completely different type of pressure. Okay, so we had like this mechanical pressure, and we have then we have blood pressure. Okay, which is also mechanical, but there is another very different type of pressure, and we need to be monitoring constantly in order to co keep the body stable. Homeostasis, social, social pressure. Did you say? <laughs> Yeah, well, yes, but that, that's a very metaphoric, like very abstract type of pressure. I'm thinking about osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure is something that we're constantly monitoring because based on the changes in osmotic pressure, there are some hormones that are released, right? What hormones are released in response to changing osmotic pressure? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, as a person, right? right? So in the hypothalamus, we have os osmo detectors that are detecting changes in osmotic pressure, right? Good. So all these things are physical sensors. And as we'll see, with the exception of vision and temperature, they are basically all mechano receptors. So they are detecting mechanical forces acting on the cells or on the tissues. Okay, so. As we'll see, and we'll, we'll talk about them at the very end of the lecture, these receptors share a common mechanism where basically a deformation and forces which are directly acting on the receptors cause signal transmission, basically. Okay? So most of them are mechanoreceptors. The exception is vision, as we'll see. That's sort of a disguised chemical sense. And temperature, obviously. Temperature, we'll, we'll see, has, has a different way of sensing. Okay? But the rest of them are mechanoreceptors and have very common, uh, have very many things in common. All right. What about chemical senses? What do we put into chemical senses? Smell. Smell. Taste. Taste. Any other? Again, think outside of the typical five senses. Okay. What other things do we t t detect anywhere in the body which are really chemical senses? There's area postrema, where we're detecting all sorts of things in the bloodstream. Okay, so those are physical senses, right? We just talked about that. Yeah, okay. It could be pain, yes. As we said, pain is kind of in between, or both in many ways. pH, absolutely. We have pH receptors. We're detecting pH, changes in pH, yeah. Okay, so we have glucose receptors, very important. We have glucose receptors, especially in the hypothalamus, but elsewhere also. Okay, so we have glucose receptors, yeah, definitely. You could say that beta cells in the pancreas are sort of glucose receptors, yeah. What else and where else do we have chemical senses? Yeah, absolutely. We have loads of different chemical detecting cells in the GIT where they stimulate or repress the secretion of various hormones, right? Incretins and all these things are regulated by cells detecting the composition of the, of the stuff which is inside the GIT, okay? So we have receptors for amino acids, for fatty acids, all sorts of things, okay? So those, those would be all chemical senses. And we will mostly cover today uh, uh, smell and uh, taste because those are the best studied but be aware that there are many 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 other senses which are extremely important in the body uh, but we will not cover them in detail because also some of them are not well studied and we don't really know how they work all right let us start with the best studied sense of all of them which is vision so we'll start with vision so what is the sensory organ for vision Okay, so somebody wanted to say eye, the eye, yes, but the retina is the better answer. Okay, the retina is the sensory organ, which is in the eye, absolutely. Um, what are the actual cells which detect light? Yeah, they are photoreceptors, and what, rods and cones, absolutely. So we have rods and cones. Now, 
what are the differences between rods and cones? What are the differences that you know of? Morphological, physiological, biochemical, whatever. Okay, so there's a difference in sensitivity to light, and what is the what is the difference? The rods are kind of more kind sensitive. Okay, yeah. So rods are extremely sensitive to light. Okay, based on experiments, a rod it can be activated by a single photon of light, which is quite incredible, right? It's an incredible sensitivity where a single photon carrying almost zero energy, very tiny energy, can excite the whole rod, okay? So that's, yeah, extremely sensitive, but the sensitivity comes at a cost. And what is the cost? What is the disadvantage of rods? You cannot distinguish between the, la between the color? Like between the that is true. So we only have one type of rod. So basically the signal is there is light or there is no light. I agree. Yes, you could say that, but that really doesn't have anything to do with the sensitivity. No, focus is really a matter of all the stuff before the light Don't hits. Hmm? So we don't see good at the, when we have a lot of light? Absolutely. Okay. So rods are only useful in very low light, okay? Much lower than we are than we have now here. Okay. As we're sitting here, the intensity of the light is such that our rods are completely saturated. They're not working at all. I mean, or you could say that they're working all the time. They're just giving a stable signal saying, OK, there's too much light. OK, so now we're not really using our rods. They are useless. OK, so they are very useful for very low light. But since we as humans mostly live in, in daylight, they are basically useless for vision at this point. OK, so there is a trade-off. You can have very high sensitivity, but that means that at at higher light intensities, you can't use them for anything sensible. Okay. So on the other hand, we have cones, which are much less sensitive to light. So they are basically useless at low light. Okay. But their advantage is that they are capable of detecting a huge range, huge dynamic range of light. Okay. Um, if some of you, and I know it's probably not done anymore, but if some of you have done any film photography, you know that the differences in light intensities are huge. Like the difference between a lit room and a full sunlight outside is several orders of magnitude. Okay, it's not like twice as much light. It's like a million times more light. And cones are capable of detecting light and giving sensible signals in this whole massive dynamic range between a poorly lit room and full sunlight outside, and they're still working, okay? Rods, they just switch off, okay? They, they can't do anything more, okay? So that's, a big, that's one big functional difference between rods and cones. Now, as you mentioned correctly, cones, we have three types of cones, okay? S, M, and L cones, we'll talk about it a little bit more. And um, these allow us to see in color, but of course, the color detection is not in the cones. The color detection is in the brain, right? Each cone is only detecting one wavelength of light or you know, one broad band of, of light. And it's our brain that puts it together and says, OK, there's color. OK, just to be, to be clear that it's not the cones that are detecting color, it's the brain that, are detect that is detecting color. All the cones are monochromatic. Right, what other differences do we have between cones and rods? Shapes. Shapes, yeah. OK, so well, what is the difference in shapes? Hmm? Sorry, just speak up. One of them looks like a cone, one of them looks like a rod. <laughs> well, yes, uh, <laughs> that is very true. <laughs> Although, if, if you told that somebody on the street, they would be like, okay, so do they like look like this? Or, you know, I mean, <laughs> okay, sort of. Yes, of course. Um, so we do have differences in shape, but the thing that is important for the function, you could say, which bit is the stuff that is really detecting the light? And what are the differences in, in structure there? Sorry? Yeah, so wh wh where, where are the actual molecules that detect light? Where are they? They are in the outer segment, okay? And if I, if I draw it very schematically, so this would be a, this would be a rod. Okay, and a cone would look something like this. Something like this. 
Okay. So we have rods and cones. And so these are the outer segments, absolutely. And the outer segments are actually, I mean, they are developed from a cellular structure, which is called, it's a very important structure that most cells have. Membrane. Well, it is made of a membrane, uh, but it is developed from a cilium. It's a modified cilium, okay? It's a primary cilium. Um, so there are actually, there's a microtubule structure inside which we normally don't draw, don't draw, okay? But it's a, it's a primary cilium, and we'll see that in several more times in sensory cells where the stuff which is actually detecting things are modified cilia. <clears throat> now, these cilia are not motile, okay? They, do, they can't move, okay? They're primary cilia. But these outer segments are just modified cilia. So this is the real cell, and this whole thing is just engorged big cilium, okay? Which is quite interesting. But anyway, the, the photoreceptors, the actual molecules which, de which detect light, are where? I mean, they're in the outer segments, but in what structures? Yeah, so it's called rhodopsin and then the three photopsins or iodopsins, that's true. But I mean, where in the cell are they just dissolved in the cytoplasm or? They're in the, they're in the membrane, they're membrane proteins. Okay, so we actually have massive amounts of these molecules packed into these membranes and, and that's where I was heading with the question, the one big difference between rods and cones is that in rods, the photoreceptors are in intracellular membrane discs, while in cones, they are in these invaginations of the membrane and that also gives them the, the different shape. Okay, so we have really massive, massive amounts of these photodetecting molecules in the membranes. Good. Now, the, the final big difference, and we'll mention a few other differences later on, is the type of pigment. So we said that the, the photosensing pigment in rods is called rhodopsin. And in cones, we have three types. In our retinas, we have three types of photopsins or iodopsins. This is something that you, that you see in, especially in older literature. In modern literature, they just call them coneopsins. Okay, so they don't call them photopsins or iodopsins because I think it can be quite, quite confusing what is what and why are they called iodopsins. Some people think that's because they contain iodine, which is obviously not true, okay? It's just based on the color because iodine is the same color as iodopsin. It's kind of violet, dark, red, violet thing. Anyway, um, so I, people who study vision call them just cone opsins, okay? But whichever term you use, we have photopsins or cone opsins. Now, as I said, and as you know, we have three types of cone opsins, okay? And the usual division of these are into S-photopsin, M-photopsin, and L-photopsin. And what do these mean? It means short, medium, and long. Because they are detecting wavelengths, the S-photopsin detects in short wavelengths, so towards the blue light, okay? Then we have the medium one, which is somewhere in between, kind of yellowish, something like that, okay? And then we have the L for reddish colors or reddish wavelengths. Okay, they are not normally called kind of, you know, blue, yellow, red or something like that, or blue, green, red or something like that. Uh, they are called SML because in different organisms, we have different places where they detect different, different absorption maxima. So this is the, the most convenient way of calling them. Okay, because they will, do, the, the actual wavelengths will differ between different organisms. Yeah. And, each of the cones will express only one of them and will therefore detect only one part of the spectrum. For rhodopsin, rhodopsin is the same in all the rods and is detecting light in a relatively narrow band around approximately 500 nanometers, which is kind of greenish, yellowish light, okay? So that's where we are the most sensitive. I mean, that's where rods are the most sensitive, okay? Kind of, yeah, green light. These ones will have the three different bands. All right, uh, let us now have a look at the actual molecular mechanism of light sensing. So 
as you all know, the, the retina of vertebrates, including us, is arranged in such a way that the outer segments where the light detection actually takes place is the furthest away from where the, where the light enters, right? So the light enters somewhere here and has to travel through all the layers of the retina before it actually hits the photoreceptors, okay? So we have kind of this inverted retina where everything important is at the very back, right? Good, so the light comes in and it hits one of the molecules of either rhodopsin or photopsin because the mechanism is the same. So I will not distinguish now between the two. The only difference really is that they detect different wavelengths, okay? But otherwise the, uh, the mechanism is the same. Now, rhodopsin and photopsins contain in them a non-protein component, which is called 11-cis-retinol. which basically we can think of as a ligand for the receptor. Why? Well, both rhodopsins and photopsins are basically normal G-protein coupled receptors, okay? They have seven transmembrane domains, they are, they are coupled to a G-protein, so you can think of them as a alpha adrenergic receptor, okay? They are actually very close in structure, at least to, uh, more to beta adrenergic receptor, but they are quite close to structure, in structure to adrenergic receptor. So think of them as a adrenergic receptor, but this time we don't really need the adrenaline or noradrenaline coming from the outside and binding, but we basically have the ligand already in, inside the, I will draw it in a second, inside the protein, and what we only need is for the ligand to change its conformation after, it's absorbed, after it absorbs light, to activate the receptor, okay? So in a normal G-protein -pro coupled receptor, we need something to bind to it. Here we have it bound all the time, and it just changes conformation that activates the, uh, the receptor. So both of them are normal G-protein coupled receptors similar to other ones. So I'll draw the structure of 11 cis retinol, retinol, not for you to know the structure, but just to show you what happens when light is absorbed. I mean, the structure is not super complicated, but Obviously, you don't need to know it. As I'm drawing it, you will notice one very important uh, characteristic, chemical characteristic of the molecule. And can somebody tell me what this characteristic is? So this is 11 cis retinol. So there's a cis bond, yeah, 11 cis, that's true but that's not what I'm after. There's something, when you look at it. Something interesting about the molecule? I mean, there might be a few things, but. By the way, I just drew it connected to a lysine. Okay, so this is not really 11 cis retinol, but it is 11 cis retinilidin lysine or something like that, okay. but. That's how it's connected to the protein, so don't worry about this. This is not really retinol, but it's already connected to lysine. But when you look at the molecule, there's something that makes the molecule a little special. And it's super important for what it does. That is, except that is, huh? Yeah, it's gonna be quite poorly soluble in water. That is true, that is true, yeah. But something that is really essential for it to be able to detect visible light. What is it? Mm, no, the aldehyde is useful for connecting it to the protein, but not really for detecting light. There's something else in the molecule which allows it to de detect visible light. Double and what kind of double bonds? Huh? Okay, it's the conjugated double bonds. Okay, all these double bonds, one, two, three, four, five, six, are conjugated. And a large system of conjugated double bonds means that because the bonds are, uh, sorry, the electrons are delocalized along the whole molecule, it means that a relatively low energy photon can be absorbed by this big system of pi electrons and can excite the molecule. If there was just one double bond, you would have to use a very high energy UV light in order to excite it, okay? 
the more double bonds, the more conjugated double bonds you have, the lower energy light it will absorb. Okay? Remember when we talked about heme? Okay? It's the same thing. Okay? So heme has however many 18 pi electrons, okay? which are connected into a big conjugated system, and that's why it's colored. It absorbs visible light. Okay? Most molecules will not be colored. They will not absorb visible light because they do not have that many double bonds. Okay? So this is what makes it capable of absorbing visible light. Right. So what happens when light comes? It is absorbed by this very large delocalized system of electrons. And what that means is that all the electrons get into a higher energy state. And that basically allows the molecule to flip freely around the double bonds. Normally, the molecule cannot flip. That's why we have cis-trans isomerism, right? But once you excite it, it can move around. It can start moving around. And this is exactly what happens. So an electron comes in. And with some probability, which is approximately 50%, a little bit higher than 50%, it will flip around this 11 cis bond and will flip it to all trans configuration. So the cis bond will turn to trans, okay? With some probability, let's put it around 50%, but it's a little bit higher than 50%. And what we get is basically the same, well, almost the same molecule, but a different isomer. Uh, let me just quickly draw it just to, to, just to give you an idea what it looks like and how it differs from the one that we had before. So as you can see from a kind of a crooked molecule, we get one which is straight. And since it is bound inside the protein, this straightening of the molecule pushes on the protein around, on the pocket where the, the, the retinol is bound, and that is what activates the receptor. Okay. So again, as I said, using the analogy of, analogy of an adrenergic receptor, there the adrenaline comes, binds, and changes conformation. Here, we have inactive ligand, in a way. And when the light hits, it turns into an active ligand and activates the protein. OK? Make sense? Sorry, it's the probability of it flipping into this. So with some probability, it's just going to stay like this, even though Correct. Yeah. So it's what I'm trying to say. It's not a deterministic process. It doesn't mean like every photon which is absorbed will cause this change. Okay. There's just some probability that it will flip. Anyway, that's not super important. Okay. You don't really need to think about it. Okay. But many of the molecules will flip, and this is how we detect light. But of course, this is just the beginning. Okay. We have a G-protein coupled receptor called rhodopsin or one of the photopsins, which becomes activated, which means that it activates a G-protein. So this happens inside the, the protein. It takes just like a few microseconds or something like that, maybe a few milliseconds. And that activates a G-protein called GT, which stands for transducin. Actually, rhodopsin was, I think, the first G-protein coupled receptor to be actually studied because there is so much of it in the retina that you can quite easily take it out and study it. Okay? It's very difficult to study adrenergic receptors because you have to look all around the body, right? There's not a huge concentration of them anywhere. So actually, rhodopsin was kind of a template which was studied first, and then all the other G-protein re receptors were like, okay, they're probably going to look like this, which they do, okay? So this is one of the first one, and that's also why the nomenclature is a little bit strange, because this is what, where we started, and then all the other nomenclature was developed. So it's called a GT, transducin. It's a normal G-protein, so when it is activated, when obviously it's bound to the receptor, to rhodopsin, that changes conformation. The G protein is activated, it exchanges GTP for GDP, right? The usual stuff. And the activated alpha subunit of transducin will activate its effector protein, okay? So similar to all the other G proteins as that we saw before. And the effector protein is a phosphodiesterase. 
It's a phosphodiesterase. So that's an effector protein that we had not seen before. Okay, it's a new one. Okay, we had adenylate cyclase or phospholipase C or something. Here it's a phosphodiesterase. And this phosphodiesterase is specific for CGMP. So it breaks down CGMP to GMP. And this causes a drop in concentration of CGMP inside the, well, the outer segment. Okay. Now in the outer segment, in both rods and cones, we have special ion channels which are dependent on CGMP. So they are CGMP dependent cation channels. And as the concentration of CGMP drops, those channels close. So we have channels which are open all the time and they allow sodium, mostly sodium, to come in. Okay. So sodium keeps coming in in the dark and as the light shines in, through this cascade, the concentration of CGMP drops and those channels close. What does it mean for the, for the membrane potential? What happens to the membrane potential when these channels close? Drops. Um, yes, but... <laughs> huh? Correct. Okay, so the membrane will repolarize or hyperpolarize because the, the normal state of the membrane is actually depolarized. Okay, so when, when we are in the dark, all the membranes are depolarized or the cells are depolarized. And as the light hits, it becomes hyperpolarized. Okay, so this is a very unusual mechanism because most other excitable cells work in an opposite direction, right? They depolarize when they are activated. These cells hyperpolarize when they are activated. Okay, a very unusual mechanism. Right, so they hyperpolarize. And the question now is, how is this hyperpolarization, this signal, transmitted further, right? Because normally we have depolarization, exocytosis of neurotransmitters and etc. okay? Here, it has to work in a different way. Well, in the dark, when those cells are depolarized, they are basically constantly releasing glutamate. So in the dark, they are just releasing, because they are activated in the dark, they are releasing glutamate. As light hits, all these things happen, and they stop releasing glutamate. So in this respect, they work the same as any other cell, only in the dark they are depolarized and in the light they are hyperpolarized. So they stop releasing glutamate. And this stopping of releasing glutamate then affects, affects the, the next cells in the cascade. And what are the next cells? What are the next neuronal bipolar, bipolar cells? Absolutely. So we have bipolar cells. Okay, I will draw them very schematically. <laughs> like this. I know they don't really look like this, but anyway, bipolar cells. And in the retina, we have two types of bipolar cells. One type is called the on cells, and the other one is called the off cells. What does it mean? Well, the on cells are activated when the light hits the retina. So they will become depolarized when there is light coming. The off cells, analogically, okay, will be switched off when the light hits. And both of these processes will be caused by the stopping of the release of glutamate from the rods and cones. Now, how, how does that work? How is that possible? How can we get two different responses to stopping the release of glutamate. Okay, so it's true, but that's not really the best explanation. It's true, yeah, that there, will be, there are different receptors, okay? There are different receptors on the on cells and on the off cells. It's true that one of them are metabotropic and the other ones are ionotropic, but really what, make, what makes the difference is not the fact that they are metabotropic or ionotropic, but it's rather the fact that they are Sorry? Location. No, no, no. What, what is the characteristic of the receptors which will cause one cell to be activated and the other one cell to be deactivated, basically? Mm. 
Well, one of the receptors are excitatory and the other ones are inhibitory. So you see how that it's a different explanation because it, you could Im easily imagine that you could have both of them metabotropic or both of, well, you could have both of them ionotropic as well, okay? So on the on cells, we have inhibitory glutamate receptors, which are actually called mglur 6 okay, metabotropic glutamate receptor 6, which are inhibitory. So in the dark, as the rods and cones are releasing uh, glutamate, these cells will be switched off in the dark because they have inhibitory glutamate receptors. As the light comes in and the rods and cones stop releasing glutamate, these cells become depolarized because they do have actually some leakage channels, okay? So they stop being inhibited and they become depolarized and they will start sending signals to the ganglionic cells. For the off cells, or the off cells, have excitatory glutamatergic receptors. In this case, it's mainly AMPA and kinate receptors. So you're right, they are ionotropic, okay? And these will be depolarized all the time in the dark because the glutamate is coming. But when the glutamate is stopped, they stop responding. Does it make sense? No. Okay, which bit doesn't make sense? <laughs> no, it isn't. And we covered it in quite some detail. <laughs> okay, the effect of a neurotransmitter is determined by the receptors, not by the neurotransmitter. There are, inhibitory neurotrans there are inhibitory receptors for glutamate. That's a fact, okay? Have a look at last year's lectures. We covered that in quite some detail, okay? Um, all right, otherwise, any questions about this? You said that we stop glutamate when there's light. Absolutely, okay? Because the CGMP goes down, the, the sodium channels close, So, when they're in the dark, the glutamate inhibits those on bipolar cells. So it's just that because it's not there, Correct, okay? And there are some leakage channels which will depolarize spontaneously the cells, okay? There's, there are also some interconnections and it's a little bit more complicated what goes on in the retina, okay? But the, simpler, the simplest description is, is this. So you have an inhibitory receptor which becomes de-inhibited because there's no glutamate and that excites the cells, okay? In a simplified way, yeah? Now, last thing about bipolar cells, um, rods only connect to on cells. Okay, so they only have an on signal. Cones connect both to on cells and off cells. And moreover, there are many interconnections between the bipolar cells by means of these interneurons called, does anyone recall? Okay, everybody's saying something else? Amacrine cells, okay, they're called amacrine cells. Okay, and there are interneurons which, which connect between the different bipolar cells. The, the function, or one of the functions, of the on and off cells, again, it's a simplification, but think about when the light is coming, okay, you will get different activation. Let's, let's imagine that they are just yeah, cones or whatever. Okay? So you will have a very, very intense activation of the cone which is inside, and then you will have a falling off intensity as you go, okay, imagine a point, okay, there's a point of light, and you will get kind of a fuzzy disk, okay, it's going to be very intense inside, and then it's going to be lower intensity and even lower intensity, okay, if you look at it in cross-section, it would look something like this, so there's a high intensity inside, and it just drops off, okay. One of the things that, the, that these on and off cells and their connections do is that they cut off the intensity like this, so this will be all intensity one, and this will be intensity zero. So basically they make sure that we get sharp vision and not, not everything is just blurry because, because obviously the intensity of light is never one and zero. Does it make sense? 
Okay, so this is this is one of the functions of the on and off cells. Okay, it's fairly complicated because a lot of image processing actually takes place in the retina. Okay, the retina itself is really part of the brain, and a lot of a lot of uh, stuff goes on. So the bipolar cells of cones will then connect to ganglionic cells, and the signal will be carried into the brain. Interestingly, the rod bipolar cells do not connect directly to ganglionic cells, but through the amacrine cells, they connect to the bipolar cells of the cones, and then they send signals into the ganglionic cells. It's not something that, I'm not telling you that to be able to figure out the whole function of the, re of the retina, it's very complicated, the connections, just to give you an idea that it's quite complicated. Okay, it's not a simple thing. Photoreceptor, bipolar cell, ganglionic cell, that's it. Just signal goes in or doesn't go. There are a lot of interconnections and a lot of processing already in the retina. Okay, fairly complicated thing. Ask physiologists, they, they can tell you more about that. Uh, good. Um, couple more things. Okay, and then we'll take a short break. Um, how do we stop the signal from those photoreceptors? Okay, how do we stop the signal from rhodopsin and photopsin? So as with all other G-protein coupled receptors, when they are activated, they will, in a short span of time, become phosphorylated by a special kinase, which is called a G-protein coupled receptor kinase. There are actually several of them. And once the receptor is activated, uh, sorry, once the receptor is phosphorylated, it will bind a protein called arrestin, and that's something that you heard about last year. And arrestin basically blocks the function of the receptor, stops the function of the receptor. And this happens within a few tens of milliseconds after the activation. Okay? So, a light hits, there is a change in conformation, the receptor becomes activated, and let's say 50 milliseconds after that, it becomes phosphorylated, arrestin binds, and the whole thing stops. Arrestin binds to Sorry? Arrestin binds to To the phosphorylated rhodopsin or photopsin. Okay. okay, again, this mechanism is exactly the same for all G protein coupled receptors. Okay, adrenergic receptors will do exactly the same thing. When they become activated, a few tens of milliseconds, they will become phosphorylated, and the signal stops. Okay, it's a very common mechanism. Now, so this happens very quickly. The, the signal is, is stopped, and basically it could just stay like that. But the trouble is, we have the, uh, the retinal still in the wrong configuration, and therefore it cannot detect another photon of light, right? Because it's in the wrong configuration. So what we need to do is I summarize it back, right? Recycle it. Well, invertebrates, okay, other animals, are capable of isomerizing it directly inside the pigment, okay? And I'll show you in a second that we have it as well. However, in the rods and cones with rhodopsin and photopsin, the recycling actually takes place not only outside of rhodopsin and photopsin, but also outside of the rods and cones. So what happens there is, that this all trans retinal, okay, so we had 11 cis retinal, this is called all trans retinal because all the bonds are trans, right? Makes sense? So this all trans retinal, within a few seconds or tens of seconds, is actually hydrolyzed from the protein, it's released from the protein, is reduced to retinol, uh, all trans retinol and is exported from the photoreceptor cells into the surrounding cells. What are the surrounding cells? Yes, it is the retinal pigmented epithelium, which surrounds those cells, right? That's the pigmented epithelium. And that's where the all trans retinol goes to be turned back to 11 cis retinol and to be re-exported back into the photoreceptors, there it becomes oxidized retinol and is put back into the empty rhodopsin molecule so that it can be re, uh, so that the whole thing can be restarted. 
Now, this whole process called the retinoid cycle takes a long time, okay? At least minutes, but probably even longer. For rods, once they are illuminated by intense light, like this one, it takes approximately one hour for them to go back to the original state. Okay, it takes about one hour for rods to recover, basically. And one of the reasons is that this whole retinoid cycle takes a long time. Okay, this has to be exported and uh, then uh, isomerized and reduced and oxidized and whatever. It takes a long time. Uh, so this retinoid cycle and the rele release of the old transretinal from rhodopsin and photopsin is not the thing that stops the signal because it would take too long. Okay? We stop the signal by means of this. But then the hydrolysis really occurs and the recycling in the retinal pigmented epithelium cells. For cones, it appears that there is another way for the recycling, and it's one of the reasons why cones are capable of recycling the retinoids much faster than the rods. Because, apparently, cones are capable of sending the, the spent or the isomerized ultrans retinal to another type of cells, which are kind of supporting cells of the retina called Mueller cells, yeah. Mueller cells, which are basically glial cells in the retina, okay? So they, they can also send it to the Mueller cells, which makes, which basically causes the, which is the reason for the fact that the recycling in cones is much, much, much faster. And it's one of the reasons why cones can adapt to light much better. Okay? because the recycling is much faster than for rods. The last thing I will say about the retina, and then we'll take a short break, is that we have another type of photosensing cells in the retina that were discovered quite recently. And those are a subset of the ganglionic cells. So some of the ganglionic cells contain another type of photoreceptor called melanopsin. And this, this pigment, melanopsin, is mostly responsible for synchronizing circadian rhythms with the light outside. It was actually discovered in some patients that had complete retinal degeneration. So they didn't have any rods and cones, okay? For some reason, for some disease, okay? No rods and cones, but their circadian rhythms were still synchronized. And the idea was, okay, the question was, how is that possible, right? And it was discovered that some ganglionic cells contain this, another pigment called melanopsin, which can detect light and is used for these, these synchronizations. Now, melanopsin is very different from rhodopsin and photopsin, and it's actually very close to the invertebrate visual pigments, okay? Like in cephalopods, okay, for example. And the, the main difference is that it is what we call a bistable pigment. What does it mean, bistable? Well, when the first photon hits, the 11 cis retinol in melanopsin turns to all trans retinol. But unlike rhodopsin and photopsin, where we have to release it and recycle it, here the second photon flips it back to 11 cis retinol. So from melanopsin, we don't have to release the, uh, the all trans retinol to be recycled, but the recycling actually happens inside the protein with the next photon hitting and it flex flips back. Then, the then another photon hits, hits it flips to, to all trans and is. That's why it's called a bistable pigment, because it's stable in both configurations. A very interesting thing, I think. All right. Any questions about vision? Yes? Uh, you said that um, the onsets um, for light, right? Like they are activated by light. Yes. But then you said words only connect to onsets. Yes. No, no, no. Rods are for detecting low levels of light. They're not detecting dark, right? They're activated by light. Both, both rods and cones are activated by light. But rods are active, I mean, 
they're activated in, even in high intensities of light, but they're only useful in low intensities because as the intensity of light increases, they become saturated. They basically just give you a signal, there's too much light, okay? They can't differentiate between different shades. They would just give you white, basically, okay? Do you understand? You, you don't get grades of shade, which you do get in low light, okay? In low light, the rods are capable of giving you different gradations of intensity. But once the light becomes too high, they just give you one level. And, and it's not useful for seeing because you just see white, okay, in a way, okay? So both of them are detecting light. They're not detecting dark, okay? But rods become very easily saturated at, at moderate intensities of light. Cones do not become saturated because they have mechanisms to adapt to high intensities of light. Okay, you had a question? Yes. Yeah. Probably, and maybe there's some regulation which is different. I don't think it's been really studied in this amount of detail, okay? So it's possibly one of the, one of the components of that is that they also send it to different cells, so they have more capacity to, to turn it around, okay? But it's also possible they have faster transport. For example, the transport is not still, it has not been discovered how it is transported between cells. So there are a lot of things that have not really been described yet, okay? Um, but it's, yeah, it is one of the, one of the reasons why they are recycling it faster, okay? The other difference actually between cones and, and rods is that the photopsins in cones have a very high spontaneous activity. So even in the dark, a lot of the uh, photopsins in cones will be spontaneously activated. In rods, that doesn't happen. It's very unlikely, it's very rare that a rhodopsin would become spontaneously activated. And it appears that this spontaneous activation of photopsins is one of the reasons why they have low sensitivity, so they're not as sensitive as rods. But then, in high light, in, in high and in light intensities, they can actually still detect light and be useful because, because they basically have a kind of a higher starting level, so to speak. Okay. All right, let's take a very short three minute break or something and we'll continue with, it's plenty. Uh, and maybe if you could just open the window so we get some fresh air and yeah. All right, so let's uh, move on. Uh, we'll be talking about the sense of smell, but as you'll see, it's not going to be as exhausting uh, as the retina because many of those things are not as well studied uh, as the retina, which is by far the best studied sense of all of them. Uh, because it's easily accessible and it's quite easy to study. With smell, it's a little more difficult. <clears throat> so I will give you the basics, okay? But the, the, the amount of details that we have for the retina, we still don't have for the sense of smell. So what are the, what is the organ of smell in humans? Okay, so there are olfactory neurons, which are the, the cellular receptors. And wh where are they? Well, they're not here, are they? <laughs> huh? Sorry? Okay, so they are at the top of the nasal cavity, okay? The very top, which <coughs> where we have the olfactory epithelium. And the olfactory epithelium is composed of normal epithelial cells and all sorts of supporting cells. So with the basement membrane. So we have a lot of ciliated epithelia. And between them, we have interspersed special neurons, which are the olfactory neurons and are <coughs> the, the sensors of smell. Now, okay, this is what it looks like, sort of. Now, remember in the retina, we said that the outer segments of the photoreceptors are modified cilia. And it's actually the same thing for the olfactory neurons where these projections that project into the nasal cavity are also modified primary cilia, okay? They're not motile, they can't move, okay? But they are where the detection really takes place. So this is a quite nice similarity between the photoreceptors in the retina and the olfactory neurons. Now, uh, the olfactory neurons in their modified cilia express specific receptors, again, G-protein coupled receptors, which are called odorant receptors.
which basically just means that they are receptors for older molecules. Okay, older molecules, older receptors. So as I said, these are G-protein coupled receptors. I will give you the cascade in a second. But the interesting thing about odorant receptors is that it is by far the largest family of G-protein coupled receptors, and actually even of all genes that we have. Because we have, as humans, approximately 400 genes, functional genes, for odorant receptors. So about 400 functional genes. And in total, there's more than a thousand genes for odorant receptors, but it looks like some of them are not functional, so they can't really express protein. Okay, maybe some of them do. It's still a little bit controversial. But at least 400 genes are expressed and are functional in our odorant receptors. Now, how does it work? These odorant receptors are not specific for one individual molecule, okay? So when we, when we talked about signaling, for example, a serotonin receptor would be specific just for serotonin, right, in our body. Now, for, with odorant receptors, most of these receptors, if not all of these receptors, respond to a whole range of chemicals, and some of these chemicals may not even be very closely chemically related, okay? So they will be similar in some way, but maybe if you draw their structures, you might not see the similarity, okay? So they will respond to a range of molecules. And moreover, there are overlaps between different odorant receptors. So one molecule can be detected, can activate several different odorant receptors. So you can already see that this makes the detection of smell quite complicated. Because unlike in the retina, where, okay, yes, there's some processing, but basically when there's a point of light, you see the point of light, okay? Here, you have a molecule which can bind to several different odorant receptors, and then a similar molecule which can bind to other subset of, of odorant receptors. And what the brain has to do is to compute this combinations of signals into what we perceive as specific smells. Now, in order to be able to do this, to really detect specific smells and be consistent. So when we smell a rose, we still smell a rose the next day and not as something else, right? Uh, as the famous yeah, uh, poetic expression uh, goes. In order to do that, we have several very interesting tricks in the system. One is that each olfactory neuron only expresses one odorant receptor. So out of these 400 or 1,200 or however many, it will express only one gene. Even more interesting is that it will express only one allele of the gene. So in all other cells, what you get is you get expressions of both alleles, right? That's why Mendelian genetics works, because you get both alleles expressed. Not here. Only one allele of one gene will be expressed in each neuron. Very unusual. It's called allelic ex exclusion. And it's a very unusual mechanism that we don't really see in other cells. Okay, so it will just pick randomly, it will just pick one allele and it will express this one allele, nothing else, out of this whole repertoire of genes. But that's not the end of weird things in the olfactory system. The other super interesting thing is, I mean, before we get there, how, how does the, what happens with the axons of these olfactory neurons? Yeah, they go through the equilibrium plate, okay, which to scale would be all the way to the ceiling, right? Because it's massive based, uh, compared to the cells. So it goes through the equilibrium plate and then into the olfactory bulb where it is connected in structures called, it is connected to the next neuron in structures called No. So the next cells are called mitral cells, but there are structures where this connection occurs. So this drawing is not to scale. Okay, there's no cruciform plate, which, as I said, would be massive, but let's think that this is the olfactory bulb. And that the connection to the next neuron occurs in structures called glomeruli. Okay, because there's a convolution of stuff, so they're called glomeruli. And the fascinating thing is 
that all the olfactory neurons expressing this one allele of this one specific odorant receptor will connect to the same glomerulus. So even though they are, in, they are somewhere else in the olfactory epithelium, so imagine we have the olfactory epithelium, there are thousands of olfactory neurons, each of them picks at random one allele of one gene of the odorant receptor, and then all the receptors, oh, sorry, all, all the olfactory neurons that express the same allele of the same gene will find their way to the same glomerulus so that they can be connected. Now, at this point, nobody knows how that works, okay? It's, a, it's one of the mysteries, okay? How, how do they find the way? But this is what makes sure that our, our uh, perception of smells remains consistent because you get the same sort of the, the same neurons connecting to the same glomerulus and then give the signal to the same part of the, the higher uh, processing centers. Now, to make it even more interesting, and I'm not sure it is possible, uh, but you all know that the olfactory neurons are one of the very few neurons that can actually regenerate, right? So when you have the flu or something, some infection, it is possible that many of those neurons will be killed by the infection, but many of them, unless obviously the whole epithelium is, is destroyed, they can regenerate. And these regenerating neurons will again pick at random their odorant receptor and then will find the correct glomerulus to connect to so that they can give the, the right signal, okay? Now, this obviously does not happen always, and that's why you may remember during COVID, especially in the beginning of COVID, there was a lot of loss of smell, and some people never really regained their smell, or their smell was a bit changed, okay? They started smelling things differently. And part of the reason probably was that the connection of the new olfactory neurons was not quite correct, okay? They probably connected to the wrong ones, and therefore the perception, the brain couldn't really make sense of the smells, and that's why they smell things differently, okay? So the mechanism clearly is not always perfect, but in, when it is perfect, it is quite incredible that the new neuron can find its way where, and, and as I said, it's not clear how that works, okay? How they are guided into the right place in the olfactory bulb. Quite interesting, I think. Now, what happens when these odorant receptors, as we said, they are G-protein coupled receptors and they are coupled to a GS protein. So they will cause, their activation will cause an increase in CMP. And this is true for all of them, okay? The whole group works the same way. So the GS protein increased CMP. And this CMP will open CAMP-dependent channels, okay? So again, it's a similarity with the photoreceptors, because there we had CGMP-activated channels. Here we have CAMP-activated channels. And these channels will allow calcium to go in. However, it is not the calcium that causes the beginning, the depolarization, causing an action potential. Another very unusual thing in olfactory neurons is that the depolarization is actually caused by opening chloride channels. So the calcium channels will allow some calcium to go in, and the calcium will open chloride channels, which will complete the depolarization. And now, hopefully, you are all thinking, how is that possible? Isn't chloride supposed to hyperpolarize the cells? Well, that's the exception of olfactory neurons. Why? They seem to keep, the olfactory neurons keep a very high internal concentration of chloride, okay? They basically pump a lot of chloride inside. So when a chloride channel opens, Instead of chloride going in, which would be the normal thing in the body, the chloride actually goes out. And that depolarizes the cell. Okay? So this is an unusual way of using chloride because they pump, they keep very high internal concentration of chloride. So the, chlor the chloride goes out and depolarizes the cell. Is 
It, it isn't. It's about minus 60 or minus something like that. Okay? It's not that different from other cells. It's not about membrane potential. It's about the difference in concentration. So they have a very high, much higher concentration of chloride than is normal. And therefore, when they open the channel, the chloride goes out. So it's not about membrane potential. Okay? The potential is quite similar to other ex, uh, excitable cells. Because there are also changes in other concentrations of ions. Okay? It's not just about chloride. Now, when people think about why we have this mechanism, the one explanation is that the outside for the olfactory neurons is literally the outside of the body. It's the nasal, cav nasal cavity. And there, what you have is a layer of mucus where these, where these, uh, these modified cilia are. So they are basically in, in a mucus layer. And it is very difficult for the body to control the composition of the mucus. Because when you have a cold or when it's cold outside or something, the mucus will become very watery and the concentrations of ions can, can actually change very massively. So these neurons probably cannot rely on a stable concentration of ions outside. So what they do is they basically make a very high concentration of chlorides inside so that it doesn't really matter what happens to the mucus because it will never happen that the concentration of chlorides is too high for it not to work. Does this make sense? Yeah, because it's a mucus which changes its composition. It can't do the same thing as other cells, which can rely, that the, rely on the fact that the outside is still the same. Here, they can't rely on that. So what they do is they change the internal composition so that the release of calcium would work no matter what the composition of the mucus is. That's the explanation that's usually given. Yeah? If everybody has the 400 genes, but then uh, each person, like the perception of smell varies, is the, like, the threshold of the concentration varies in the... Uh, yeah. Mm. There could be many reasons for that, why, why people perceive things differently or are differently sensitive. Okay? First of all, not necessarily all the genes are expressed all the time in all the epithelium. Okay? So we may have slightly different subsets of these, of these genes. Okay? That's one reason. Now, you may have different numbers for different numbers of neurons expressing a specific, specific gene, a specific odorant molecule. Okay? And then there's also the processing. Okay? So, the, it's, so the signals may be processed a little bit differently. Okay? What also plays a role actually in the perception of, uh, of smell is the anatomy of the nasal cavity and the speed of air that goes in. Because basically, as the air, let's assume that this is the, this is the front, okay? this is where the air goes in. As the air goes in, the molecules contained will start diffusing through the mucus layer and the brain can actually detect the time so it knows okay here it hit first and there it hit last okay so there is some type time component and therefore the speed with which the air goes in will also change the perception of smell okay so there are a lot there's a lot of variation that can cause why people perceive smells differently or are more sensitive to one smell or the other one this is also connected to the fact that in textbooks and everywhere you will, you will read that humans are, do not really have a well-developed sense of smell compared to other animals. Apparently, that is not true. Okay? Apparently, humans are as good with a sense of smell as other animals, as like mice or, I mean, dogs might be a little bit better, but for example, mice and rats, which were considered as like one of the masters of smell, the detection limits actually are quite similar in humans. So humans seem to be as capable you will read in textbooks that humans only can detect about 10,000 smells. Apparently, that's not true. We can detect trillions of different smells. Okay? And the reason why we, have difference, why we feel that there are differences between some animals and humans are that we have different repertoires of smells. Okay? So a rat would be very good in smelling, I don't know, some decaying stuff. I don't know what they really smell or you know, some types of food or whatever. But humans, for example, are extremely good at smelling flowers of plants or um, fruits and stuff like that, which probably other types of animals like dogs don't really need. So they have, do not have these, um, these genes developed. And that's why humans probably are comparable to all other animals in their sense of smell, but they have different repertoires of smells. So we are more sensitive to some types of smells and less sensitive to other types of smells. So it's quite an interesting revision of this myth that humans can't really smell properly. Right. Um, 
I will not go into perception of pheromones. That's a, quite a complicated uh, thing, controversial thing. It's not very clear how that works. We do not seem to have a functional vomitor nasal organ, which is what most animals have for detecting pheromones. However, we do have specific uh, uh, olfactory neurons uh, interspersed between the, the other ones, which can detect some pheromones. So we can detect pheromones, but it's still not really well studied how that works and what are the pheromones, etc. So I will not go into that, okay? But we, we can detect stuff called pheromones. Um, Good. Any questions about olfaction? About smell? No. Let's go to the next chemical sense, which is taste. Now, what are the sensory organs for taste? Um, yes, but really, it's not the tongue. It's the taste buds. Okay, the taste buds are the real organs. They are on the tongue, correct? But they are taste buds. And as you all know, the taste buds are composed of many cells. Some of them are sensory cells, but the other ones are just supporting cells. And these cells are not directly neurons, but they are connected, so they are basically modified epithelial cells, and they then connect to neuronal fibers and cells which carry the signal away, okay? So they are not, they are basically secondary, uh, secondary sensory cells, right? Now, in every taste bud, there are several different types of cells, and each type of cell basically detects a different type of taste. Now, as you all know, there are five basic tastes, okay? Sweet, sour, salty, uh, what is the next one? Umami, and I left one out. Bitter, correct, yeah, bitter. So we have five basic tastes. However, recent re research is telling us that there are probably other types of tastes. For example, metal taste, okay? When you put a piece of metal in your mouth, it's a strange taste, okay? It's not any of those, okay? There may be a taste for fat, for fatty acids, okay? A special type of fatty feeling, okay? But let's leave those aside because they're not still well studied and how they work. Let's talk about the five basic tastes. Now, Three of those tastes are detected by G-protein coupled receptors. And that is sweet, umami, and bitter. Okay? These all three types of cells are type two cells in the bud, but it's not something that you probably covered in histology, so I don't think it's really important that they are called type two cells, okay? So let's, let's leave that just for your interest if you want. So all these three types of tastes are detected by three different cells with three different types of receptors. They're all G-protein coupled receptors and they belong to a group of taste receptors. We have two subgroups of taste receptors. Taste receptors two, taste two receptors, which detect bitter taste. And we have approximately 25 genes, so 25 different receptors for bitter compounds. Okay? So it's quite a large repertoire of possible substances that we can detect as bitter. One of the explanations for that is that in evolutionary time, or you know, the evolution basically tried to to equip us with detecting dangerous, with the ability to detect dangerous chemicals or plants or whatever, which will taste bitter and we will avoid eating them. Okay, so that's why we have so many genes, probably. That's why we have so many genes for detecting bitter things because they are basically warning, don't eat it. Now, of course, humans have developed a good sense for eating bitter things and we like them and we enjoy them. Uh, but yeah, we're going against the evolution or, you know, or our brains actually could figure out that some of the bitter stuff is not gonna hurt us and is actually quite good. Uh, so we have T2Rs, about 25 of them, which, which detect bitter stuff. Then we have the T1Rs and they are responsible for detecting sweet and umami, but there it becomes a little bit more complicated. So the umami, taste is detected by T1R 
but T1Rs exist, exist as heterodimers. So they are composed of two types of T1s connected together. And the umami is TR1 plus 3. I will explain it again, okay? I will just show you what they are and we'll explain again what, how that, what that means. And the sweet taste is uh, 2 plus 3. So we have basically three types of T1 receptors, one, two, three, okay? We have three genes for T1 receptors, T1R1, T1R2, T1R3. And they only form functional receptors by taking two of them together. And if we take one plus three, we get umami receptor, and we, when we get two plus three, we get a sweet receptor. Does it make sense that they are heterodimers? Okay, yeah, sure. Okay, people look a little aghast by this complication, uh, but that's how it is. As you all know, the, the sweet taste can be elicited by a number of compounds. Okay, sugars, of course, but there are many other things, artificial sweeteners, some you know, inorganic compounds can taste sweet. All of these will bind to these receptors. And umami is typically described as the taste of glutamate. Okay, so these are really glutamate receptors. However, these receptors can also be activated by other stuff. And if you, for example, ribonucleotides like inosine monophosphate, okay, and if you look at the composition of some of the like uh, instant noodles and stuff like that, you will often find this inositol ribotide or inositol monophosphate or something like that because they want to write on the packaging that it doesn't contain glutamate. So they use other stuff which also binds to these receptors, which are these nucleotides, okay? So more, more than one thing can actually elicit umami taste. It's not just glutamate and amino acids. Um, a little interesting thing is that um, there is a protein called miraculin um, which binds basically to sweet receptors and it changes the perception of sour into sweet. Okay, so it's a, it's a little peptide uh, from a, an African plant. Um, and if you eat it, if you eat the fruits, okay, this little peptide will bind to your sweet receptors and not do anything. But then when you drink lemon juice or something, it tastes sweet. How does it work? Well, the peptide binds to sweet receptors and acts as an antagonist. It just sits there and doesn't do anything. But as the pH is lowered, it changes its conformation and starts to be an agonist on the sweet receptors. So you will perceive what is sour as sweet. Okay. Just an interesting. Yeah. Ask your question. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's not going to denature. I mean, you know, when you drink lemon juice, which is pH four or five or something, it's not that low actually. Okay. It tastes really sour, but the pH is not that not that low. Okay. Um, you're not going to denature the proteins in your mouth or anything like that. So the pH is not that low, okay? You would get denat denaturing like pH 1 or something like that. But lemon juice is not actually that low, okay? Coca-Cola is actually pretty low. Uh, but even that is not going to denature your cells um, uh, because they're protections and everything. All right, so these are type 2 cells and they are detecting these three types of tastes. The remaining tastes are salty and sour. Sour receptors are ion channels for protons. Okay, so they are proton channels, which basically allow protons to go in and excite the cell. Right? So that's another type of cell. So it's, you know, each type of cell has different receptors. So sour are proton channels. And for a long time, it was unknown which channels they are. But now we, well, the most likely candidate is a channel called OTOP1, which stands for autopetrine 1. And that's probably the one which is responsible for detecting sour taste. Salty taste, again, is an ion channel. And the probable channel is called ENAC, which stands for epithelial sodium channel. Okay. 
it's still with a little bit of a question mark. Okay, it's not one hundred percent sure that that's the one, but it's the most likely candidate for the salty taste. How is the signal then propagated further to those nerve fibers and nerve cells? Well, in the type two cells, the ones that have these three types of G protein coupled receptors, the the coupling is via ATP. Okay, well, so here we have a G protein coupled receptors, which are coupled to a G protein called gustducin, like gustatory, yeah, ducin, whatever, which activates phospholipase C and releases IP3 and calcium. And this calcium then activates the release of ATP from the, the taste bud cells, which then activates purine receptors on the nerve fibers. The interesting thing here is that this release of ATP is not via exocytosis, as you would expect. So it's not packaged into vesicles and released by exocytosis. It's actually released by a special channel which opens, which is dependent on calcium. Calcium opens the channel and just lets the ATP to flow out. There is a little specialized mitochondrion next to it, which just produces ATP to be released outside and to, be, to, be, to activate the, the nerve fibers. Okay? In fact, this is a special a new type of synapse called channel synapse. Because there's no exocytosis, the neurotransmitter is just released through channel. Interesting. The neurotransmission in the sour and salty cells is still a little bit unclear. Okay? It may be ATP, it might be glutamate, it's not very clear. Okay? You can see there are so few of these cells to study that it's very difficult and we still don't know how that works. Okay, we have one minute and we still have to talk about mechano sensation, which is hearing and all the other ones, and temperature. Okay? I'll try to condense it so that it still makes sense, okay? And we go through everything, but I'll try to make it as short as possible. So for mechano sensation, which is hearing, touch, vibrations, proprioception, uh, uh, balance, all these things are just mechano sensors, which are detecting some pressures, forces, etc. All these mechano receptors work by having ion channels, which open when they are pushed or pulled. Okay, so it's a physical thing where the channel is usually connected to some cytoskeleton. And as you push on the cell or pull on the cell, it just physically opens the channel. That's how all of them works. Okay? In the hair cells in the inner ear, we have these hairs, which in this case are not cilia. They are stereocilia. So they are actin-based, not, not microtubule based even though there is a cilium there as well, which is a primary cilium, non-motile, but that's, that's not doing any interesting, stu any interesting stuff. The interesting stuff happens on the stereocilia, which are connected by tethers, by protein tethers. And as the endolymph flows around and vibrates, these stereocilia, they are deflected in one direction or the other direction. And it's the tethers which pull on one side, basically, and open the channel, which then allows the depolarization of the cell. Does it make sense? The, the stereocilia are deflected, the tether pulls on, on this stereocilium and opens the channel. And then as it count goes back in the other direction, it's gonna pull on the other stereocilium and will open another channel, okay? The channel in the auditory hair cells is, is, ha, was actually until very recently was unknown, but in very recent papers it appears that it's called TMC1 and TMC2. Sorry, and two, which are likely the channels in the hair cells which do this, what I just said. Okay, but a very similar mechanism could be uh, used for the for the cells in the vestibular apparatus. Only there we are pushing other stuff okay, around, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So most of the mechano sensors work like this, even though the channels might be different, but it's really just about deformation. Osmoreceptors work the same way. Okay? 
you have a cell which, when the osmotic pressure is lower outside, it will start sucking in water and it will expand, and this expansion will open channels just by pulling them apart. Okay? When the osmotic pressure is higher, it will start shrinking and those channels will close, for example. Okay? So all the mechanoreceptors work like this. One interesting thing, and just give me two more minutes, okay? One interesting thing about the hair cells is that there the depolarization is caused by potassium, okay? Because the concentration of potassium in the endolymph, here we have endolymph, is significantly higher than in normal extracellular tissue, uh, extracellular uh, fluid. In fact, it is about the same as inside the cell. So the potassium concentration here and here is the same. But because the potential is about minus 50 millivolts, or 60 or thereabouts, when you open potassium channels, so these are potassium channels, when you open potassium channels, the potassium will flow in. Again, it's different from all the other cells where potassium will flow out. Last thing, temperature. We have two receptors for high, well, we have one receptor for high temperature and for low temperature. The one for high temperature is called TRPV, which is an ion channel which basically opens when the temperature increases. How does it work? Well, it's a channel that has a sort of a very disordered domain. At low temperature, the domain kind of flips onto the channel and blocks it. But as the temperature increases, just by thermal movement, the domain will start moving around and will start opening the channel, which then activates. Does that make sense? So we have a channel inside the membrane, and that is a floppy domain. At low temperature, it just sits on the channel. At higher temperature, just by thermal movement, it will start moving around and open the channel. And that's how we detect increased temperature. For low temperature, we have a similar channel, which is called TRPM8, which works basically in the opposite direction. So there's a floppy domain, which basically keeps the channel closed when the temperature is high. Okay, as the temperature goes out, it kind of solidifies and opens the channel. Okay, so it's just an opposite mechanism. The TRPV is activated by capsaicin in chili, or the compounds piperidine, or whatever it's called in pepper, okay, and all these things. So it, it can be chemically activated, and we get the sensation of heat, even though there's no heat, right? The TRPM can be activated, for example, by menthol. Okay, so menthol will activate this, and we have this perception of cold, even though it's not really cold. Okay, sorry about taking five more minutes of your time. Uh, do you have any questions? Yes. Um, I don't know. I'm not really sure what the what the thresholds for activation are. Okay. I think the cold one is definitely not activated at like normal body temperature, but I can't really give you the exact temperatures. I don't really know how they activate, but it's probably easy to find out if it's known because a lot of these things are just not really known. Yeah. To some extent, okay, so they will, the activation of these receptors can cause the perception of pain, okay. However, it appears that when there's pain caused by high temperature, it will not necessarily go through these receptors, okay. It will be, it will, there will be some non-specific non damage receptors which will be activated, okay. So, yes and no. Yeah. Well, but the burning that you get after chili is a little bit different than when you take a hot poker or something and you just stick it. It's, it's a different type of, I mean, it's, a, it's part of the perception, but it's not the whole perception, if you know what I mean. They do, absolutely. Yeah, they absolutely do. But I'm just saying that like a burning pain is this plus something else. Yeah. All right, okay.